Hi, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from in the country. Uh, we appreciate you so much for joining U.S. Pain Foundation's November webinar titled A Grandparent's Voice, Advocacy and Support for Chronic Pain Families. My name is Shanna Smith. I'm the Director of State Advocacy and Alliance Development for U.S. Pain Foundation, and I'll be your moderator for today. And we'll begin our webinar momentarily, but I just wanted you to know um, ways that you can make the most out of this webinar experience today. So you do have the ability to ask questions of our presenter. You're going to just use your questions pane or that question button that you see on your control panel. And you just simply type in your question and click send. And our presenter has been kind enough to um, allow questions throughout the presentation, as well as at the end where we'll have a short question and answer session. And she'll take as many questions as we have time for. Now, if you're also experiencing any technical difficulties, either with audio or, or visual for this presentation, go ahead and feel free to submit those issues in the questions pane as well. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Nancy Renee. And uh, US Pain Foundation is so grateful that Nancy's decided to take the time to uh, spend some, some moments with us this afternoon and educate families within the pain and chronic illness community during our November campaign, as there's just a huge value in being able to share our personal experiences and tips and other types of information with families who may have one or more children within their family that has a chronic condition. Now, Nancy spent her career in education. She served as a teacher of mathematics, a school administrator, and a math consultant for 36 years total. And now in retirement, Nancy's chosen to work with various advocacy organizations such as Family Voices of California and Chronic Care Coalition of California. And she's also served as a member of the Board of Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. And she regularly will attend conferences that relate to sickle cell disease. She's also a patient advocate for the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Nancy has a high school aged grandson who does live with sickle cell disease, and she has a granddaughter who was diagnosed with autism, and therefore she's able to utilize both her past and present advocacy experiences to empower those within her family. Again, we thank Nancy for participating, and I'll let her begin today's presentation. Nancy? Hey, good morning. Thank you, Shana, for the, those kind words. And uh, good morning or good afternoon to those of you who have uh, joined the webinar. I'm so glad to be spending the next hour or so with you. Well, here we are, the grandparents' role and uh, becoming an advocate. I broke advocacy down into these four sections. You might think of others or you might decide that you don't need all of them, but this is what kind of worked for me. And you'll see there's a lot of overlap, but you'll see what we did as uh, we go through the presentation. Well, this is my small family, my daughter, Suzanne, my grandson, Joseph. He was much younger there. He's almost as tall as I am now. And my myself, my granddaughter, Valerie. So you have one person that you are advocating for, and of course that's Joseph, but really the whole family to support. So being an educator, of course, I always think of learning as the first step. And in this case, what is the illness or injury? And some of these illnesses have quite long scientific names. So you have to kind of make sure that you have the right thing. What are there resources that can help? And if so, where are they? How do I get to them? And be sure to think of yourself. Do I know anyone who can support me? And we'll get back to that through the presentation because at least for me, I found that to be a critical piece. Well, I didn't follow my own advice. I knew that my grandson had sickle cell disease because it's an, inher an inherited disease. My daughter told me about it when she was pregnant. But the baby looked fine and healthy and doing baby kinds of things. And um, we really didn't realize, or we were just maybe in denial, thinking that, 
oh, okay, everything is going to be okay. He's going to be one of these people that the disease doesn't affect too much, but uh, we were wrong. So what happened is that I called her to wish her a happy new year. And in fact, let's go back to that nice picture of Joseph and found out that he had been taken to the hospital with what was a severe sickle cell crisis, crying nonstop, not eating, not sleeping. Eventually he had a stroke. He was only nine months old, but that's one of the things that happens to uh, people with sickle cell disease is that the blood cells that clump and, and sickle when they release oxygen can also clump together in the brain, causing a stroke. So I realized, hey, I have to learn the science behind this. If I'm going to help him and help the family, I better know something about what I'm talking about. So of course, reading carefully, asking questions, joining organizations, and using the internet wisely. So those were the things that I tried to do so that I had pretty much of a handle on what was going on. Luckily, I began to get involved with larger groups. And here I am attending the NIH, that's the National Institute of Health Conference. It was in Bethesda, Maryland. And there were lots of scientists, but there were many patients. Uh, the person standing behind me has become a good friend. Uh, she's what we call a sickle cell warrior in that she's the person living with sickle cell disease. So we had patients and advocates and scientists, and it was good for us to meet and really put our heads together. And the question that I asked them, at least as I remember it, it still really hasn't been answered, is how do we get the good ideas of the research from the lab to the bedside? Because it seems like researchers know all of these things that are going on and all of the reasons for a disease. And yet when you get to the doctors treating a patient, especially if you have to go to the emergency room, you'll find that the doctors there are not aware of some of the things that have been going on in, uh, in the field of study. So when you're learning the science, you're gonna come across stem cells. And stem cells are an important addition to our understanding of disease and injury. Those of us with an ill or injured child are hoping for a cure. But you have to stick with trusted resources. And our desperation makes us vulnerable to focused treatments. In fact, it was funny, there was an article in the LA Times, Los Angeles Times, just a few days ago about a company that was under scrutiny for advertising a stem cell cure when it really wasn't doing anything but doing some kind of a, a focus treatment that was not based on any science at all. So it's important to, to understand and trust and know who the trusted resources are. So that's a little bit about learning and we're gonna get back to that again because of course, um, learning keeps going. You learn and then you network and then you find out there's more things to learn and then you collaborate and then you find out that there's more things to learn. So that's why I put this in kind of a circle. It sort of goes around from one thing to the other. So uh, now is kind of a good time to see if there were any questions about the first part of this learning, any uh, things that maybe you did in your journey to understanding your child or grandchild's illness. So Shana, anybody mm -hmm. uh, put anything in for the sure. learning section? Uh, let's pause for a moment and, and give our attendees the chance to, uh, to ask if they had any questions about that first portion that you just went over. Okay, nothing yet. I think, um, well, one question that I do have for you when you start the learning process is how do you 
avoid becoming overwhelmed with all of the information when you first find out that a child in your family has a chronic condition? Uh, you know, for, for me, I'm kind of a talker. And when I'm, I'm overwhelmed, maybe emotionally, because I'm taking all this learning in, but I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, through the whole thing. And for me, I've got two or three trusted friends that have helped me in the past, and I usually get on the phone and tell them what's happening and where I am, and just the conversations seem to settle everything down. And it's it's interesting how, although my friends don't have grandchildren with sickle cell disease, they may have another issue that they're dealing with that is also very serious. So they get the idea of, you know, having a child with a serious disease, dealing with the parents who are also trying to figure their way through the whole thing. So for me, just uh, relying on my friends, that's what's worked. And of course, that's kind of perfect. That's the beginning of networking. So let's keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, just last year at the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America their national convention. They have great national conventions. They're often in Baltimore, but I've gone to some in Atlanta. Uh, but like many conventions, there's a vendors area. And often with sickle cell, it might be a researcher explaining what it is that he or she is researching with the idea that eventually they're going to have to have some research subjects to make sure that this is uh, that their process works. They might need a whole range of people, you know, a wide age range and so forth. So they're doing you the favor of explaining what it is they're doing, but they're also trying to get you interested because, I mean, that's the fact of life that uh, we have to have some research in order to make sure that these uh, uh, processes work for people and that they're safe and effective. So uh, that was one of the things that I always like to do with networking. So I've worked with a number of community groups. I just mentioned SCDAA. Family Voices of California is a really good one because it works with families that are dealing with really serious issues, you know, uh, fragile X syndrome, uh, leukemia, uh, just a number of things. And some of the diseases that they work with are so rare that no one much has heard of them, including uh, legislators. So they help people get together to uh, form some bonds and connections. And we uh, once a year go to Sac Sacramento, which is our state capital, to uh, you know kind, kind of advocate for legislation that might assist people with those serious conditions. Chronic Care Coalition of California, they're very concerned about continuity of care and uh, they've just developed a program called My Patient Rights. And they're bringing that to all of the states so that people know what their rights are when they're facing a disease, what their rights are in terms of hospitalization, pharmacy, all of those things. I mentioned uh, CIRM before, that's our California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. That's our stem cell group. And they, they do research or they support research. And uh, that came because the voters of California passed uh, some legislation years ago to provide some taxpayer funds for that kind of stem cell research. And I'm so glad we did. It's made a huge difference. Cayenne Wellness is a local group that is becoming statewide in that they have uh, summits on sickle cell disease once a year. Uh, we've had them in Los Angeles, in uh, Fresno, which is kind of central California, in Sacramento, which is our state capital. And they also do uh, support groups for adults and their families who are dealing with sickle cell disease. Access Advocacy has a podcast on uh, sickle cell disease and, of course, the U.S. Pain Foundation that I'm so happy to begin working with. 
Okay, as I said before, learning and networking really go hand in hand. And here we are again at the SCDAA conference this year, and that was just one of the many presentations that was made. So I'm learning about something, but there are also a lot of people that I'm interacting with. And they're there for a reason, because they're a family member, because they are a sickle cell warrior, a person who has the disease, because they are a researcher or a doctor. So it's a great opportunities to network. And I have met people, and I'll see them year after year at the convention. So for those of you that are dealing with uh, your own uh, health issues of a child in your family, the conventions are great. And sometimes it might cost a little bit to get there. Like this is in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So, uh, but many of the organizations have scholarships if, you know, traveling that far is an issue. And uh, one of the things that I would suggest is that you make up a simple business card. You know, you can get them when it doesn't cost too much. Even if you don't belong to a larger organization, just have your name, your contact information, and you'd be surprised. Yes, it's the digital age, but when I go to these things, I trade cards with lots of people, and then a day or two after the meeting, I will write them an email. It was so nice to uh, know you and hear about your research or hear about what you're doing in this particular area, and uh, please, if you've got a mailing list, please add me to it so I can continue to be updated. So that's kind of a good strategy that I use. Okay, uh, supporting. And supporting means for me, it, it's really what kinds of things do you do to support the family? But it's also, I guess, just like that commercial about, you know, if you're, or, or it's not a commercial, I guess it's instructions on an airplane. You know, if the oxygen mask comes down, put it over your own nose first before you start trying to help whoever is with you. And uh, that's what supporting means to me. You've got to support yourself. You've got to find that group of trusted friends, trusted resources, because stuff will happen. There's just no way around it. I would like to think that, okay, we're gonna get all of these things together and everything will be fine. No, it won't. Stuff will come from out of left field. So for me, finding a support group was an important thing to do because I was then able to connect with other people who were dealing with the similar issues to what I was dealing with. In some of those conferences in here, again, now we get the overlap between learning and networking and now supporting. You can have personal conversations with people. But you have to encourage the child's parents to participate in these groups as well. Because it's so easy for them to caught up, get caught up in just the busyness of dealing with their family, their job, having a sick child, going to the pharmacist, many doctor's appointments that it's really hard for them to find a support group that they need. And they might want to rely on you, but you really can't be the support in that way because you're a little bit too close to the situation, at least in my, my feelings about it. I, I like for my daughter and son-in-law to find a support group on their own, that something that can work for them, that can be an additional way for them to deal with the issues that they're dealing with. But closer to home, uh, what does support look like for me? And I put down babysitting now. Remember, this, this grandson is now almost as tall as I am. And I'm tall. And so you can't quite call a kid who's 5'8 and weighs over 130 pounds, you can't call that babysitting. Even granny time seems kind of strange, but at any rate, we have time together. But support can also be connecting with other family members, letting them know what's happening. If there are other children in the family, take the other children out for a special time, because I think it must be hard to be the brother or sister 
of a child who has a chronic illness. And so in my case, uh, my granddaughter and I uh, go out and go shopping, you know, any of these things can give the parents a break. And sometimes they're kind of afraid to ask you to do it. And sometimes the child is so sick that you are the only person that can be trusted to deal with this child. I mean, if the child is on a, a feeding tube, for instance, you're not, not gonna call the teenager down the street to come babysit that child. And so as much as you can, volunteer for babysitting or child care or granny time, whatever you want to call it, just to give the parents a break. Okay, and so I, see this was last year. He's grown maybe five inches in one year. This was last year. We were getting ready uh, to go for blood transfusion. And because uh, this is Joseph and because he has sickle cell disease, he gets, uh, blood transfusions pretty regularly, but luckily the hospital is not far from where I live. Luckily I'm able to do it. I have a separate room for him so that he doesn't feel crowded if he has to stay overnight with me. So uh, that's kind of a good thing. You know, I'm gonna go back to this for a minute because one of the things when he and I are alone, he might tell me something that he has not told his parents. Now, maybe it's nothing much. Maybe he can't stand his English teacher. So it's the kind of thing that you can talk through. That's kind of a typical grandparent stuff. And I kind of think of that as grandparent privilege, you know, like, like lawyer, attorney, client privilege, that he can tell me things and I can help him work through them. I don't feel a great need to, you know, tell his parents or anybody else most of the things he tells me. But sometimes a child, especially a child with a chronic illness, will tell you something serious. Maybe they will express um, deep anger, anger at themselves or the illness or life in general. Maybe they will be just kind of flat emotionally, you know, not not happy or sad about anything, and you think, ooh, could that be depression? And those are things that you have to tell, and you have to tell the child that it's important that his parents and his doctor know what's going on. And so you don't kind of go behind his back and say, oh, you know, Joseph told me this or that. No, you let him know that this is so serious that you have to tell his parents. But, uh, you know, in that way, any child will understand. In fact, sometimes I really believe that kids tell you things because they want an adult take on the situation. They, uh, they want to get a sense that there's somebody there to help them with these serious feelings because it's hard enough being a teenager and dealing with your feelings anyway, let alone being a teenager and being reminded you know, uh, you, you better drink plenty of water so you won't get a sickle cell crisis, or you better do whatever it is that is the important thing for a kid to do with any of the other illnesses. So, oh, as I say, sometimes granny time can be just that. And it's kind of a relief to talk about the latest styles in, in shoes for skateboarding. He likes skateboarding. But you could also play a vital role, connecting the dots, keeping a record. Here's what I mean by that. Because I take uh, Joseph to the doctor for blood transfusion so often, I have really uh, a number of interactions with the doctor and nurse. And so like the last time we went and the doctor noticed a heart murmur, it's, we were all thinking, is this unusual? Is this an issue? And I remembered that he had found the heart murmur previously, years ago. He's got hundreds of, of, of uh, patients. I have just Joseph. I reminded him that he had found it before. He went for the old records from five years ago 
and found the, the heart murmur and found the EKG and the tracing and all of that. So just the fact of your being there can really help, as I say, connecting the dots. And sometimes you have important decisions to make as a family. Should there be this operation or should there not? Is this medication best or is it not? If you have done your homework, if you have your resources, if you have learned something, then you can ask intelligent questions that help the family figure out how to make an important decision. So, you know, that's where all of this is kind of coming together. I'm going to stop for a minute because I've been talking about a lot of things. We're going to continue with support for a while, but let's see if there are any questions. So, Shana, anything that anybody has asked? Um, yes. Someone wants to know if you think that the child's primary care provider actually provides enough support. Or does it really depend on that primary physician? That's, you know, I'm so glad that that, that question has been asked. That's really kind of an issue. Uh, here in California, there's all kinds of managed care that wants the child to go to the regular pediatrician. Most times you will find that families want the child to go to the specialist for in, in our case, it's a pediatric hematologist, but it could be a specialist that's, that works with any of the rare conditions. And most families that I've talked to would much rather have a specialist for their child because the condition is so rare and often so complex that the typical pediatrician is not going to be able to provide the support. But then we get into all of these issues about insurance and managed care and uh, whether or not the child or family is on Medicaid or, you know, all of those things that make it a very difficult choice. So I can just tell you that I'm so glad that we have a pediatric hematologist because that's who, who Joseph sees several times a year for the blood transfusions. And when he needs shots, they give him the shots. You know, the other kinds of things that would normally happen to a kid are all handled by his specialist. Now, in what ways do you think that a child's pediatrician or, or specialist can support the family? Um, well, you know, it kind of depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm lucky enough that because Joseph is, is on transfusions, and he's there for three or four hours as, as he's being transfused. There's lots of opportunities for me to talk to the doctor and the nurse. And I, I tell you, he's got a great nurse. And uh, nurses can often be, you know, a great kind of bridge between the doctor and the parents or grandparents. But uh, for him, it's it's easier because He's, he's there at the hospital for a long time. For shorter periods of time, that would be a challenge because, uh, you know, and with the practice, it could be that the doctor is just in for a few minutes. So my suggestion is if a family is there uh, with a doctor who doesn't have time to see the family for any lengthy period of time, to use the nurse as a bridge to, you know, have any questions. And then I'm always a believer in putting things in writing because then you can't say, well, I never voiced this concern. Uh, yes, I did. No, you didn't. No, let's put it in writing to the doctor, to the hospital, what the issue is. That way, you know, you give them a certain amount of time to get back to you. And then here comes the second letter, you know, and uh, that goes back to the my patient rights. Do you have, is that an expectation? Well, yes, of course it is. So uh, that's my suggestion. If, if, you, if a family feels they're not getting enough information or support from the doctor, then they need to start voicing those concerns. I think that's that's great advice. And because we're talking about medical appointments, and um, I, I know that you had shared that you have brought your grandson for these different um, transfusions and other appointments, should 
should uh, people um, who have a family member, who, you know, a child specifically, should we be offering to attend or to bring these children to medical appointments? Or is that overstepping our boundaries with the parents? How do we go about that? Um, it, it, it wasn't overstepping for me, at least. I don't think it was because mm -hmm. I asked it. I didn't say I'm going. It was like, well, would that help you if I, you know, would it mm -hmm. help if I did this? Would it help if I do that? And leave it to my daughter to say, no, 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 I got this. I'm OK. Or sure. Oh, that would help. You know, so it just it's how you ask it. And I think I think it's a good idea because it's just so much to expect the parents and especially if uh, it's a single parent family to expect one person to make the decisions on this really challenging situation. To me, the more help and the more you know and the more you can go to the appointments, then uh, your daughter or son has somebody to say, well, gee, what did you think of that? I was surprised that they said that. Did you understand that? You know, so that you can then have a conversation about what happened with the doctor. And I just want to back up to the network portion. Um, were you able to attend these conferences or talks and, and workshops while you were having a full-time career? Or is that something you weren't able to do until you were retired? Yeah, well, luckily, <laughs> my grandson was born after I retired. So okay. I was able to do it. That would have been a challenge. The The shorter answer is no, I wouldn't have been able to do nearly as much, especially not going to Baltimore, Maryland, or Washington, D.C. I couldn't have done it. I was finishing up as a high school principal, so I was dealing with graduation and football games and, you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, that That's a challenge. But in a family, maybe if the grandparent can't do it, maybe there's an aunt or uncle who can, you know, uh, kind of look around and see what might help. And for many diseases, there are uh, conferences that are held locally, as I mentioned, uh, Cayenne Wellness doing the sickle cell conference in California. Those I would have been able to attend next year's conferences in San Diego. And so I can drive down there and I would have been able to you know, take a day or two off work. But uh, many times people can't, many times they're working in a situation where the amount of time that they can take off is limited. And, uh, but just like your webinar is available over the internet and people who are working right now can listen to and look at what we've been doing later on when they get home from work, there's always a way. So don't think, oh, gee, I work full time. I can't do it. Investigate what's happening on the Internet. That is great advice. All right, then I will. Um, th no more questions currently. So if you want to continue into the support as it relates to school issues, that'd be great. OK. Um, again, you remember that Shana said that uh, I was a school teacher and school administrator for 36 years. So, of course, I'm thinking about support for school issues, and I'm thinking about the kids that I had at my school. Now, I just ran a, uh, the places where I work were always just regular schools, so I was not involved with kids who were in the hospital school. Sometimes some of the children that we had went to a hospital school because they were diagnosed with something serious or because they had had a bad, often a bad accident. and. Uh, but the the staff at a hospital school, you know, it's really hard to know the child's abilities and interests when they're so sick. You know, when they're dealing with pain, pain just takes all of your energy just to tolerate it, quite frankly. Of the people that I've seen that have gone through a painful uh, events and a painful crisis, uh, that's just difficult and really hard for kids to continue with their schooling. Now, sometimes the things get resolved. You know, they've had the, the broken leg, it's broken in several parts, they've had the operations, but now they have to sit for several weeks as it heals. That's a good time to get caught up in school issues. But in a regular school, the parents and the child may be afraid of being labeled. and. Uh, 
that that's just too bad because to me it's dangerous if the staff at the school does not know what's going on with the child and you've seen the picture of my grandson he looks kind of like a, a typical kid except that since he had the stroke his right arm and leg uh, are weak and when he types he really doesn't type much with his right hand. Maybe he presses the space bar or whatever, but he certainly doesn't use all of his fingers because they just don't work that well. But uh, when a teacher asked him why he wasn't using his right hand, he was okay with saying, oh, it's because I had a stroke. And then the teacher said, oh yeah, my father had one of those. You know, I mean, it, it was okay. So uh, I'm saying not to be worried about it. And it's important that the staff knows about the illness and can be prepared if something happens. And uh, Joseph was in about the fourth grade when he got hit in the face with a basketball. You know, the kids are out playing. They're not very good. Those big balls come and they bang you up. Well, of course, the and schools in California do not have school nurses. No more school nurses. And so they expect the secretaries to handle a child who's been hurt on the playground. Uh, anyway, they were about to put ice packs on his face because he was kind of bruised. He knew that ice was not good for sickle cell disease. It can cause a crisis because uh, people with sickle cell disease don't do well with cold. Well, he told that nurse, no, 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 uh, don't put an ice pack on me. I have sickle cell disease. It will cause a crisis. And the, the, the poor secretary looked up like, what? This little kid is telling me all of this stuff, but I'm glad he did. He had been taught at home about what to do and he paid attention. So those are school issues. But you can see now we're dealing with mental health. And to me, this is, if you take nothing away from this uh, webinar, think about mental health. Any person or family member dealing with a chronic painful illness is likely to have mental health issues. I wish as a society we would get over stigmatizing people with mental health issues. It's a natural process. That's what happens when you're dealing with these serious, serious issues. So I say find out about the resources in your community. And if there is a workshop for caregivers, go. Go now. Don't wait until something comes up and say, oh, gee, what should I do? Like, remember when we were talking about the, the, the granny confidentiality, you want to have gone to a group and hear about depression and anxiety in chronic illness so that if your grandchild or family member is speaking in ways that lets you know, hey, they're anxious, they're depressed, they're worried, that you not necessarily know everything to tell them, but you know where to go and you know where to send the parents. And I mentioned uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness is a resource. And I have to tell you that that came from networking. Through networking, I met a friend who has a daughter with sickle cell disease. She told me she had been to this uh, mental health resource uh, where she lives and she really liked it. And she invited me to come with her. There were about 20 parents, all of whom had various kinds of issues. Some of them had diseases, some of them had drug abuse, just a number of issues. But I was so glad that that friend connected me with a me mental illness resource. So far things have been good, but stuff is bound to happen. It's just bound to happen. So uh, that's why I say the same is true for the parents of a critically ill child. My goodness, it's a lot to ha handle. It's just a lot as you're trying to deal with the other stuff that parents typically deal with. What's going on if you have other children in the family who are not ill, who are, are healthy, and stuff is going on with them, boyfriend, girlfriend problems, all of those things. So uh, support for mental health is really critical. And of course, this is the pain foundation. So support when dealing with pain. And all of you listening know you've been through this. You know that each child can experience pain differently. 
and that it's important to try and strike a balance between showing my own worried face and saying it will all be okay. I, I don't like that when I'm in pain from something. Oh, don't worry, you'll feel better. Well, but wait, I hurt now. And I'm worried about why I'm hurting so much now. And so you're telling me that it will feel better. It's probably true. But for a child that's dealing with pain, that might not be true. They might not feel better later. And that's very hard for us as caregivers to, to deal with that. But uh, distracting video games, I remember a couple of times when my grandson was in a crisis. And that's what I meant by each child may experience it differently and each child may deal with it differently. I think he felt proud of himself for dealing with it without calling the doctor, without going to the hospital, without asking for additional uh, pain relief. And uh, he knows the things that work for him, a, a, a warm heating pad, laying on it in certain positions help. And even though at the time he had this crisis, he was 10 or 11, he wanted me to read to him. He reads just fine, but somehow he liked the idea of my reading, whatever the story was, and that was the distraction. So whatever works, uh, you know, begin to use it and don't worry about using those distractions. They certainly help more than adding stress to the situation. And again, this is what we've been saying. But I didn't say that parents may be dealing with their own painful issues. Because, you know, we parents, all grandparents have been parents. It's like, oh my goodness, I should have done this or that. I knew I shouldn't have let him have that ice cream cone. I knew I should have done whatever it is. And so all of that adds to the stress of the situation. And uh, just remember that distractions can help. I was the other day I was with one of our adult sickle cell patients and it almost seems counterintuitive because he was dealing with a very painful crisis but he didn't want to keep saying well how is it now are you feeling better now well now what's happening so I started about talking about music he likes music and so do I and it it felt kind of strange to ignore how much pain he was in but I really felt it was the best thing I could do at the time so don't forget distractions can help. Okay, support in the emergency room. Now, when I say you can't always be prepared for this, it could be that you are dealing with a healthy child who is in uh, an accident, has an accident at school, gets hit by a baseball, whatever it happens to be. As a grandparent, see the other grandparents don't live in this country, so I'm basically it. I have a copy of my child's, my grandchild's insurance card. Getting an extra copy is not hard. And that helps you access the health system, especially if you are babysitting on a regular basis. That's one of the things you need to do. Knowing the location of the nearest ER, well, that sounds kind of silly. I know where the ERs are around my house but my grandchildren live 35 miles away. So I don't always know the location of everything that's near their house. And if you're on a trip, scout out the area first. And in fact, my daughter was quite concerned because they went to Mexico a few years ago. I don't blame her for being concerned. You have to kind of put all of that travel kinds of things in the back of your mind when you're thinking about uh, going out of town or going to a national park. Oh my goodness, you know, uh, they're in rural areas and they might have emergency rooms that are fine for hiking accidents, but may not be fine for whatever your child is dealing with. And of course, I'm talking about our special cases. You know uh, ahead of time that they could end up in the ER. Maybe the child has a hard time breathing and you know that an asthma attack can happen at any time. Right now, if I go down and open up the trunk of my car, you'll see my go bag. It's actually a paper sack, but hey. And uh, it, inside are just a few things, uh, a sweatshirt in case it, it, it gets cold wherever we are. Uh, the 
doctor's notes and I have to remember to update that. So whatever is the latest issue that has been discussed, something on the letterhead of the doctor so that there's written instructions. And that's especially important with pain medication because unfortunately with what's happened with the opioid crisis, oh my goodness, it is really hard to get pain relief. And especially if uh, your child is taking uh, pain medication on a regular basis, just be sure that it's listed there so that uh, you know there won't be any problems getting the relief that the child needs. Okay, the last thing is collaborating, and I'm so glad that the timing is about right because this is where everything kind of comes together, at least for me. Collaborating, you can see I've got raising questions or concerns, sharing those concerns, and collaborating to work on legislative issues. So sometimes, like when we were talking before about uh, the primary care physician and the specialist and managed care, all that comes because of legislation. And so getting involved with lawmakers may be intimidating, but is necessary. So of course, finding out who your state and congressional lawmakers are, connecting with groups that have similar issues. Hill Day at SCDAA was very good. We came from all over the country. There must have been two to 300 people there. And we met the night before with some training on advocacy, how to meet with your legislator and so forth. We had organized meetings with our various congressional reps. Uh, we had a packet that we called a leave behind, which is a summary of the top issues that you want to discuss. And for most legislators, they don't want to talk in general terms. They want to know if there's a bill that you are looking for support on. And uh, we went to Washington for the Sickle Cell uh, Treatment Act. It didn't pass that time, but uh, it's, it's, it's back before uh, the Congress. So this is a group of us. You can see me, I'm standing next to my granddaughter. My daughter is over there in the middle and, and her son, Joseph, in front of her. Then we have another uh, group of people. The two boys both have sickle cell disease. And uh, this is their congressman, or he was their congressman. He's retired. Uh, and we have somebody now who we think will be more effective. He said to us, well, he couldn't vote for the Sickle Cell Treatment Act because he was chair of the Armed Services Committee. And if he did that, he was afraid that his fellow congressmen would not vote for his issues. And we all thought, what? That didn't make any sense to us. But hopefully now that we have a new person in Washington from my daughter's congressional district, we'll be able to get uh, better support for sickle cell disease. And that would go, that would be true of all of you there. Find out who your congressional rep is. And we all know that healthcare was a big issue this year. So see what works for you in terms of who your representatives are. So we're getting to the conclusion. You can see, be ready for the long haul. We know that network and collaborate. Know that your love and support is vital to your family, but don't be afraid to take care of yourself. Don't, don't say, oh no, I can't do this. I've got to do this other thing. No, taking care of yourself is critical. So this is advocacy. Uh, you can see that it's kind of a cyclical thing, the learning, networking, collaborating, supporting, and then it starts all over again. So now's a good time for any final questions. Perfect. We do have a few, Nancy. Um, someone wanted to know, and, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this or not, but I'll, I'll pose it to you first. If you know what the role of a pain specialist is, and uh, I'm not sure if your, your grandchildren see one or, or if, you, well, if you encounter them. But a friend's daughter does. And I can, you know, I mean, I hear about the, the pain doctor. She has sickle cell disease as well. Um, but 
The concern that I have is, does the pain doctor understand all of the fine points about sickle cell disease? And so usually pain is being caused by something. So I don't have a good answer to that question either. Okay. I do, I do know that not speaking of the role for the, um, for the attendee who asked this question, but, you know, usually a pain management specialist is another member of your child's um, treatment plan and their team. And they usually try to use um, various uh, techniques or treatments in order to address pain. I know in some circumstances, they can provide some um, in-house um either, you know, I don't, I won't say procedures, but either um, pain management or they could um, make recommendations where you can go and seek some alternative or um, uh, prescription uh, methods to address pain, um, you know, whether it be non-surgical or using medications. Um, usually that's what, you know, the pain management specialist is, is just another member of, of that team. Mm -hmm. um, and and I only know from, uh, you know, same thing with networking. Um, my son does not see a pain specialist, but I have friends um, who either see them or their children do. Right. Um, but the second question from this um, attendee, Nancy, I think um, is very much so in line with what you've been talking about, which is, you know, it does take a lot of time to take care of uh, either children or anyone with chronic conditions um, especially, you know, in, in this presentation, we're talking about sickle cell disease. So my question or, or this question from our attendee is, do employers provide uh, any or enough time off in order to take care of a child with these diseases? Uh, my answer would be no. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, most of the time, you know, you get however many illness days and it's it, illness or family leave days and so forth that are paid, generally about 10 a year. And after that, I think it depends if you're working for a small company where you know the, the person, you know, you know the employer uh, and they know what your situation is. Working for a bureaucracy, as you know, I've worked for a, a school system, you know, which is a huge bureaucracy. And so in, in my school district, I could have taken more time and gotten half pay for that. But as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, hmm, I could have taken it as a parent. I don't know if I could have taken it as a grandparent. So I think the answer is very individual and to advise people to ask their employer. Right. And I, you know, I do know that you, you did mention uh, Family and Medical Leave Act for those um, who are unfamiliar. I, I think it's a great place for you to just, uh, you know, quickly research um, and type it in FMLA, um, because we do know that there are some eligible employees that do have the right to take some time off to care for a family member who may have either a serious health condition or maybe they're recuperating um, from, from a condition. But you'll want to make sure you know, that you're within your right and that your employer is within your rights by, by really looking at the um, Family and Medical Leave Act. Yeah, I think that's good. And that reminds me of the My Patient Rights. And that's a website that I, I don't know if I put it on my resources, but it's uh, My Patient, without an S, My Patient Rights. And they, there might be uh, some information there. Mm, okay, that's great. Uh, does any, if anyone else wants to ask uh, Nancy questions, please feel free to um, type them in the in the questions panel. And while they are doing that, um, I did have um, a few other questions for you, Nancy. I was taking some notes, uh, and I wanted to know how do you recommend checking in with the parents of a child with a chronic illness, um, whether you're part of that family or you're just a neighbor. Um, without seeming or, or coming off as either being too nosy or, or overly involved, um, what, what advice do you have for checking in with those parents? You know, it, it, it's a, that's a difficult one, you know, uh, because there's so many ways that it can go. For me, if I already have a relationship with the person, that makes it that much easier because I'm not coming across as, you know, just nosy Nancy wants to find out about the child. <laughs> 
but you know, somebody who already has a relationship. I would be very cautious if I didn't already have a relationship. Uh, just, you know, hi, how you doing? How are things going without, how are, how are things going? You know, with that, that worried look that says, oh, I see that your child is in a wheelchair now. And how is that, you know, uh, I, I would be very cautious with people that I didn't already have a relationship with. That makes sense. And um, you mentioned the idea of a go bag, uh, which I think is brilliant. And it, I saw that it was on the slide um, where you mentioned ER visits. And of course, you know, I think it's great for unforeseen ER visits. But do you or someone you know use a go bag um, for any other circumstances outside of, you know, in preparing for the what ifs? Um. I don't know. You know, in, in California, I, you guys have your own kinds of emergencies. We have our emergencies in California. And as we've had these wildfires, uh, people have their go bags for a fire in case they're asked to uh, evacuate. So they've got, uh, you know, basic stuff, passport, maybe a laptop, maybe a couple uh, changes of clothes, a sweatshirt, you know, that kind of thing. But people have that stuff ready to go during fire season. Even though you might hear a fire is 30 miles away, you might get yours together because you know you're living in an area that's, that's close to, you know, where a brush fire uh, could happen. Uh, we have stuff uh, for earthquakes, you know, in case you're out and, and you need a pair of tennis shoes because you can't walk in your fancy high heels over broken ground. Uh, but many people with sickle cell disease uh, have that bag because unfortunately with the opioid crisis and with people with sickle cell uh, taking high doses of opioids, they've all got letters from their doctors. Many of us ca uh, carry uh, printouts from the NIH guidelines about sickle cell disease because you get into an, an ER and the ER docs are just afraid to administer the amount of drugs that people routinely take. Right. Now, does your, um, in your experience or with your own family, do the parents share medical information with other family members to have on hand in case of an emergency? Like, do you have a printout of medical information and history? on your grandchildren? Um, I have it really basically from my grandson because since I take him to the visits, when right. it's the visit summary, I get it. Uh, I don't have anything with uh, about my granddaughter because although she has autism, she's healthy. So uh, I haven't, uh, we haven't even broached that subject. But if you're dealing with a child who's sick, I, I would ask the parents, and use this webinar. You know, I was listening to something and they said it might be a good idea for me to have, you know, whatever the latest uh, medical record is. And uh, since I'm not a government agency, I'm not worrying about HIPAA. But to me, if you're sharing things among family members and everybody agrees that you ought to share them, I don't see that as an issue. Right. And I'm thinking more of uh, you had mentioned the Grammy time, and I'm sure that there are some attendees that are that are listening who um, may at one point or another, you know, cared for a child with um, some sort of medical condition at the time. And maybe it, it would have been helpful to have something tangible in case of an emergency or in case they have um, a flare up of some kind. Exactly. No, I think I think that's a good idea because it's scary, you know, as the grandparent to take care of a child who you know has got some serious issues going on and you don't have anything, you know, just sort of run through the what ifs in your mind and discuss with the parents. And you, that's great because my follow-up question with discussing with the parents was how much do you share with the parents when the child is disclosing certain feelings or emotions about their chronic illness? Do you pick and choose personally what you're going to share? with that parent or is it only in those serious circumstances that you'll um, share some details about the conversation you had with your grandson? You, you know, that, that's a difficult one. If, uh, if something like that came up and I didn't know exactly what to do, that's when I would go back to a resource like in, in Los Angeles, we have LA County Mental Health, 
I would call and speak to someone, even though it was somebody that I didn't know, and just share what the information was and get kind of their take on what I should do. So sometimes you're right, it's something that's kind of in a gray area. It's not super serious, but yet you want the parents to know this and you don't want to get caught in the situation where you know some things that the, later on the parents will say, why didn't you tell me? Right. So that, that, would, be, that would be my choice. If I couldn't decide, I would go to a trusted resource and, and get a better idea of what I ought to do. Perfect. Well, I know that you also have um, some resources that you provided for us. Um, so attendees that participated, you'll see on your control panel on your screen, the handouts, it says two of five. If you click on that, you can download a resources page um, that Nancy has provided. Most of it is uh, relating to the nonprofits or in, you know resources that she's used in putting together this presentation. And then the other one is specific to uh, sickle cell disease. Nancy, I know that you also wanted to thank a few of the groups um, on, on your slide. I think it's uh, towards the end here. I'll yes. let you have that opportunity because I think um, for you personally as a grandparent, your advocacy toolbox has increased because of these groups. Yes, it, it has. It's really been helpful. I've spoken about a lot of them. I haven't mentioned one SCD voice. Uh, that is a website for people with sickle cell disease. I'm so glad that they are in operation. I mentioned the College and Cats Family Y. That's our West Side Family Y in Los Angeles. Because I go there, yes, I get some good exercise, but I've met some good friends and we've had a couple of family group meetings just to talk about general family development stuff and it's been very very helpful the east la family resource center has been my connection to family voices and uh, i was lucky enough to uh, be a roommate with one of the advisors from the family resource center and we found out that we have all kinds of things in common and she's been a great resource and a good friend and of course to the U.S. Pain Foundation, I'm so glad that, that you are putting this November uh, program together. I think it's a great resource for the community. Thank you. We appreciate it, Nancy, and we appreciate you taking the time this afternoon to provide some uh, additional, very uh, insightful and empowering information for grandparents and, and really just, just caregivers. I see here that you're making yourself available. Um, is that right, if attendees would I like should. to reach out? Yeah, so if anyone wants to contact me, I'm just here. I'm not a big, you know, office full of folks, but I'll do my best to respond. Oh, that's perfect. And uh, I do want to thank you again, Nancy. We have two more webinars scheduled for November. Uh, one of them is on the 29th, and that relates to service dogs for teens and tweens presented by Needs. And then we have another one on November 30th which is going to focus on caregiver burnout. And we'll have someone who has uh, some very familiar experience uh, with that, uh, raising her daughter and trying to find that balance between yes. uh, being a parent and, and a caregiver. And, and, and how, do, how do we go about recognizing those, those signs? So if you wanna register for those other two um, events coming up, I, uh, I ask that you just take a moment and go on the US Pain Foundation's website under our programs, you'll see our November campaign and all of the registration links live there. But you can also send me an email and I will be happy to send you a registration link. My email is Shana, S-H-A-I-N-A at uspainfoundation.org. Thank you again so much, Nancy, and for everyone else who has taken the time to learn a little bit more about how you can advocate for a pediatric pain warrior. Have a great afternoon. Thanks very much.